Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, may my words draw from your written word to be to us your living word, Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. When you were in primary school, um, if you think back to that, were you told not to string sentences together with and? Well, I remember doing that. I remember being told that that wasn't the right way to do things. You know the kind of thing? Um, we went to the beach and I had ice cream and the ice cream was strawberry and the strawberry ice cream was nice and we went in the sea and we got back in the car and we went home. It was just explained to me that was a, a really, really bad way of doing English. Well, the, the funny thing about New Testament Greek is new, a lot of New Testament Greek is almost the opposite to how we're told to do English. In New Testament Greek, the norm is that things are strung together. Very often using the word and, but it can be all sorts of other words. Um, what have we had in today's reading? Truly, I tell you, again, and, all sorts of words, just little words that just string passages together. And today's passage is, is like that. It looks like several separate ideas of Jesus that Matthew has brought together and strung together with these, these little words. And the first of those passages is some words of Jesus about what to do when you see your brother or your sister sin. Now, it would be really interesting if we could have a discussion. I'd love to know how you react to this. But I suspect that the strong English reaction to seeing your brother or your sister sin is to turn away and pretend you hadn't noticed. It's a form of inverted embarrassment, really. We just don't like to confront other people or to do anything that seems to enter that kind of world of um, discomfort to the English people. I think most of us would be horrified to challenge somebody else's behaviour. But you know, I also remember way back in the 90s that in some, part, some branches of the church, and this included some parts of the Church of England, they fell into what then became known as heavy shepherding. And it was really where the person who was leading the church the vicar or the other kind of leader in other kinds of church churches would very, very heavily tell people what was wrong with them, expect them to put it right, tell them to report back to them. And it was a hugely controlling thing. It was hugely damaging to the people who were involved in those kinds of churches because it kind of stripped them of their personal... Um, their personal liberty and their personal responsibility, in a way. So let's come back to this passage, this passage which tells us that if your brother or sister sins, we should go and point out their fault, just between the two of you, at least to start with. And you know, as I pondered that passage, I had a kind of a light bulb moment because I realised that that passage runs ahead of 20th century psychology by, well, about 20 centuries, really. And what it suggests would actually really be good for us to put into practice. And I'm going to try and um, take you through a little bit of very straightforward psychology. And some of you may have heard this. Have you heard of the Johari window? It was developed by two psychologists back in 1955. They were called Joseph Luft and Harrington Ingham. But you don't really need to know that. 
Now I'm going to try and show you this. I think I'm going to have to stand up. This is just something I printed off from the web. And this is a very, very simple idea, really. It suggests that the things in our lives that are known to us and to others can be divided into four areas. Firstly, there's the simple area, the area that's open, the area that's known to ourselves and known to other people. So, for example, you all know that I'm a vicar. And I know that I'm a vicar. It's a very trivial example, but it's a good example. You may also know I was a scientist, and I know I was a scientist. But actually, this is a really healthy area to grow in, to, to, to be using. And it's an area of transparency. But not everything in our lives is like that. There are also some things that we keep hidden. So I, if I think of a trivial example, I know the, I, I have a, uh, Lorraine and I have a house down in Deal that we rent out. I know the address, but you don't. But there are other things as well. There are other things. These tend to be the sorts of things that perhaps we're ashamed of, the things we keep hidden back. And for some people, these can this area of life can be very, very large, not just a quarter of their life, but a very large aspect of their life. And then there's this area here, the blind spot area. And this is interesting because this is the area where other people can see things about us, but we actually can't. So if I think again of my own life, I think of some of the things of my, well, when I was a lot younger, when I was um, a youth, and I, I kind of slightly cringe, actually. I think, my goodness, other people could see things in me that I just couldn't see myself. And I kind of wish they'd told me, actually, because some of those things I then would have had an opportunity to have put right. And then, of course, there's this last category of things that we don't know about ourselves and others don't know either. And the idea of the Jahari window is that, broadly speaking, the more that we can dwell in this area of our lives, the more comfortable we'll be, the more knowledgeable we'll, knowledgeable we'll be about ourselves, and the more we'll be able to be open with others. But the interesting thing is this blind spot area. So the blind spot area, we need other people to share with us things that we just don't see about ourselves. Could be that in some situations we're really rude and we just don't know, we have no idea. And other people see it and they kind of tuck behind their backs, but nobody takes the effort to actually tell us um, you know, what it is that we could do to put these things right. So the importance of what Jesus is saying is that we can address these things in our blind spot if others feed back to us. Now, of course, we need to do so very gently and cautiously, not full of either self-righteousness or self-indignation, but if we want to grow as people, this is what we need to do very, very gently so that the area of our lives, this open area of our lives, can flourish. Now I have to say as well, also in, in the church, has been in the past, and sometimes unfortunately, well more than unfortunately, sometimes appallingly, still in the present, the abominable abuse of vulnerable people, even by members of the clergy. And this is surely part... Excuse me, I'm trying to get my camera back again. This is surely part of this hidden area here, where people know things about themselves and are practising things 
but they're not known to other people. And this is a very, very dangerous area within the church. And one of the huge problems that has been discovered as people have looked at this horrible area of abuse is that the clergy have been treated as kind of super beings and nobody would hear of criticism, even when it was staring them in the face. My challenge to you today is not to go around looking for sins in each other. That's the last thing that we should be doing. After all, Jesus said that to... Um, pull out the uh, plank in our own eye before we deal with the, uh, with the, the uh, splinter in, in somebody else's. So let's not go around looking for sins in each other, but rather let's try to be the kind of people who are open enough that we can hear from others without becoming deeply offended, so that we can grow as people so that we can become holier, actually, as people. Although at first sight it seems countercultural, as we reflect on these words of Jesus, I wonder whether some of the problems in the church today might not have happened if we had taken Jesus at his word. And so let's now start to take Jesus at his word in our lives and be open so that we don't have hidden areas, we don't have blind spot areas, but we have open areas. And of course, the last good news about this little diagram is that whilst we have areas that are unknown, God knows those things. And we have a good God, a God of love and mercy. And if he reveals to us things in that unknown area, it's not because he's wrathful and fearful, but because he loves us and he knows what's best for us. Amen.